This is called How Computers Work. It's part of the CS50 recommended books. Famous quote, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Often attributed to Isaac Asimov, but it's uh, Arthur C. Clarke, who's his predecessor, I believe. Sorcerers have their magic wands, powerful, potentially dangerous tools with lives of their own. Witches have their familiars, creatures disguised as household beasts that could, if they choose, wreak the richest havoc. Mystics have their golems, beings built of wood and tin, brought to life to do their master's bidding. We have our personal computers. PCs, too, are powerful creations that often seem to have a life of their own. Usually they respond to a wave of a mouse or a spoken incantation by performing tasks we couldn't imagine doing ourselves without some sort of preternatural help. But even as computers successfully carry out our commands, it is often difficult to call the feeling that there's some wizardry at work here. And then there are times when our PCs, like malevolent spirits, rebel and open the gates of chaos onto our neatly ordered columns of numbers, our carefully wrought sentences, and our beautifully crafted graphics. When that happens, we're often convinced that we are indeed playing with power not entirely under our control. We become sorcerers' apprentices, whose every attempt to write things leads to deeper trouble. Whether our computers are faithful servants or imps, most of us soon realize there's much more going on inside, inside these solid boxes than we really understand. PCs are secretive. Open their tightly sealed cases and you're confronted with poker-faced components. Few give any clues as to what they're about. Most of them contain, consist of sphinx-like microchips that offer no more information about themselves than some obscure code printed on their impenetrable surfaces. The maze of circuit tracings etched on the boards is fascinating, but meaningless hieroglyphics. Some crucial parts, such as the hard drive or power supply, are sealed with printed omens about the dangers of peeking inside. Omens that put to shame the warnings on a pharaoh's tomb. This book is based on two ideas. One is that the magic we understand is safer and more powerful than the magic we don't. This is not a hands-on how-to book. Don't look for any instructions for taking a screwdriver to this part or the other. But perhaps you're knowing more about what's going on inside of all these stoic components make them a little less formidable than when, when something does go awry. The second idea behind this book is that knowledge in itself is a worthwhile and enjoyable goal. How about that? This book is written to respond to your random musings about the goings-on inside the box you sit in front of several hours a day. If this book puts your questions to rest or raises new ones, it will have done its job. At the same time, however, I'm trusting that knowing the secrets behind the, behind the magician's legerdemain won't spoil the show. This is a real danger. Mystery is often as compelling as knowledge, and I hate to think that anything you read in this book takes away that sense of wonder you have when you first manage to make your PC do some grand new trick. I hope that instead this book makes you a more confident sorcerer. All right. If automobiles had followed the same development cycles as the computer, a Rolls Royce would today cost $100, get a million miles per gallon, and explode once a year, killing everyone inside. <laughs> Robert Kringley. Introduction to the 10th edition. This book was so much easier to write 10 years ago. Computers were relatively new, and they were all pretty much the same. There were, there were only a few important differences, whether it was an Apple or a Wintel that is running a Windows on an Intel processor. There are some variations in size, portability, and customization enthusiasts could do anything, could do uh, by installing different drives and expansion boards inside PCs. Stuffing the newest fangled components to my computer at PC Computing, the magazine where I worked, was a wonderful pastime and the source of many stories in the magazine. If I made a mistake and the computer groaned its last breath, that often made for an even better story. One reason PC disaster is made for good reading is that every computer user had a similar story of computer disaster. We're all in the same boat because even the editors of the computer magazines, if truth be told, didn't know what they were doing a lot of the time. Back then, if you took a class in computers in college, you waited your turn to run a program on some monster of a computer that would return a solution in the form of punch cards. There was no play formal place to go about to go to learn about PCs. Manuals were useless beyond finding out how to plug a PC in the wall and where the switch is located. Programmers, programs that worked one way had no resemblance to how other programs worked. You learned about computers by trial and error, by going to user groups made up of equally befuddled PC owners and by reading magazines. Before I went to work for PC Computing in 1989, my teachers were PC Magazine, PC World, Byte, Popular Computing, and other magazines covering this new technical phenomenon. You found a morsel of information in one magazine and a nugget in another, and eventually you pieced together what was going on inside that steel box on your desktop. But I was going to tell you why it was easier to write this book 20 years ago. Back then, you could say all someone needed to know about a floppy disk and a couple of two-page spreads. Something as mind-busting as intricate as a monitor you could do with one illustration. The technology was, in retrospect, elementary. How computers and their components worked was actually simpler when you sketched it all out and added some call-outs and arrows. No wonder I figured I could 
with the help of a great illustrator, write a book that laid out all the mysteries of what was really a fascinating technology. But today, Lord love a duck. Today, there's not even a simple explanation of what a computer is. Simply having a microchip doesn't cut it. Microchips are everywhere in watches, cars, thermostats, ovens, reg refrigerators, flashlights, dog collars, coffee pots, even cats. Uh, just about anything that uses electricity. But these aren't computers. They're just electronic doodads that use the abilities of microprocessors to perform routine chores. To be a computer, something must be programmable. It must be capable of doing different things based on the instructions you give it. Your yard sprinkler system is a computer. True, it doesn't do a lot of different things, but you can program it to water different parts of your yard for different lengths of time and on different days, or not at all if it's raining. Microwave ovens are computers you use by programming it on the fly, by setting how long it will cook at different temperatures, or you can push a popcorn button to tell the oven to use a pre-programmed sequence. These are all computers, but the truth is they're not very interesting. How deeply do you care about how your sprinkler works? But a computer that can be programmed to do so many different things, now that's a computer worthy of the name. And we see them everywhere today. Phones, cameras, tablets, music players, and TVs have all become computers that are indispensable parts of everyday life. Our lives are richer for the knowledge, problem solving, communication, entertainment, health, and income they provide. They certainly deserve to be included in a book that calls itself How Do Computers Work? The problem, my problem anyway, is that they make organizing a book like this an exercise in controlled chaos. In previous editions, I simply had a section on storage and other on displays and one on networking. I admit that in this edition, I've fallen back on that system in some chapters out of pure convenience, but certainly the workings of today's computers are not so compartmentalized. The more I looked at computing in the last 20 years, the more it struck me that the real story of how computers work is how they are like living creatures, organisms that have evolved and continue to evolve. These metal and silicon and plastic and glass animals have followed the same patterns of mutation, natural selection, and survival of the fittest that Darwin found in plants and animals. I've tried to explain how technological developments following the same rise and fall that carry organic species to new shores. Today's achievements in computing are possible only because they rise out of the fossil beds of the earlier technology. There is no way for today's technology to have been invented from scratch. I recall that some 30 years ago I was working for a computing service company that relied on mainframes, an obsolete term to describe computers the size of a couple of high-end refrigerators slammed together. They used two kinds of storage, hard drives and magnetic tape. The five megabyte hard drives were the size of large garbage cans and the platters where information was stored could have doubled as hubcaps. You had to see, you ha had to have seen the magnetic tape at work to understand one of the computer's most common terms, RAM, random access memory. It sounds as if data retrieved willy-nilly from all parts of the memory chips with no order to it. Memory chips got their RAM moniker because retrieving tape memory was not random. If you wanted data stored on a reel at the innermost 10 inches of tape, the computer had to wind through the first 3,500 feet to get that data. Sure, it would have been better to skip tape altogether and go straight to hard disks. But to paraphrase a certain infamous quote, sometimes you don't build computers with the technology you wish you had, you build them with the technology you have. Life in the primordial seas had to get the hang of existence as one-celled organisms before the cells could master hooking together and dividing up the jobs needed for mutual survival. Some of the bigger organisms learned to move by wiggling. They developed a way to filter oxygen from water, and later that system developed into lungs that could suck oxygen out of water. It took millions of years for these changes to evolve. You couldn't create magnetic disks until you learned how to record data to magnetic tape. Then it took years of engineers trying first this and then that to make the disk smaller and at the same time more capacious. Current solid state drives come from the fossils of technological forays such as bubble memory that didn't, that didn't survive. Maybe we'll talk about core memory some other time. <clears throat> core magnetic memory, very interesting. Uh, old uh, first memory made by DEC. The most amazing aspect of this whirlwind of technological progress is that it's only taken 20 years to go from floppy to solid state, from displays that amounted to stick figures to animated graphics that are almost indistinguishable from film images. That smartphone in your pocket is more computing power than those refrigerator-sized mainframes. The wires that have been needed for communications for a century are likely to disappear completely in the next 10 years, along with the need for local data storage. It's possible the keyboard and mouse will become extinct. In fact, much of the hardware we're used to today as it gets smaller and more efficient may migrate from our desks and our pockets to become parts of our eyes, ears, and brain. And that's just in the next 20 years. Beyond that, we can't imagine what will become a technology any more than single-celled organisms could have imagined a dinosaur. Let's check back with each other after a couple of decades and then see what may be possible. All right, this is a battery and a light switch. <laughs> Chapter one, what makes a computer a computer? If you want to find the secrets of the universe, 
Think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Nikola Tesla. Those of us who studied physics in high school half a century ago had to learn about the six simple machines. There was a wheel and axle, the lever, the pulley, the inclined plane, the wedge, and the screw. <laughs> the explanations of how they saved us labor were invariably accompanied by illustrations of people who looked like they were working awfully hard. Just as invariably, someone would quote Archimedes saying, give me a long enough lever and a place to stand and I will move the earth. Note that Archimedes gave somebody else the really hard job, finding a lever that would have to stretch from earth to Jupiter. Still in the days before any form of power, other than the muscles of man and horse, the simple machines were ingenious. Those six machines were combined in various ways to create wagons, catapults, irrigation systems, roads, bridges, and, need I mention, the pyramids. Put some teeth on a wheel and you get a gear. Combine gears with levers and pulleys and you have a clock. The ingenuity with which clever people combined simple machines into complex and powerful machines grew every century, abetted by engines running on steam, water, compressed air, and chemical fuels that magnified the power of these simple machines turned complex to a point that even Archimedes didn't imagine. Then came electricity. Here was a mysterious force that would run through the right kind of metal wires. Those wires could be bent and wrapped around other wires and in pieces of metal to produce an engine that, unlike water mills, was portable. One that, unlike steam and chemically fueled engines, didn't threaten to blow up. If electricity had produced no more than a safer, more efficient motor to run all these complex and simple machines, that in itself would have been a boon to civilization. But scientists and engineers discovered new properties in this force, despite the fact they didn't know what it was and couldn't see it. You know the results. Everything from the electric light bulb to the computer, smartphone, tablet, in which you might be reading this very book. Electricity really began to pay off when engineers looked beyond its ability to make a filament glow or a motor turn. They began to discover more possibilities in electricity's partnership with magnetism. In the electromagnetic fields produced by electricity that would interact with other matter, even over great distances. They found that electricity and light were the two facets of the same thing, an electromagnetic spectrum with mostly invisible fields made of waves vibrating at different frequencies and the sizes which range from the microscopic to the earth encompassing. Like the simple machines of medieval ages, these new elementary principles could be combined in endless ways to create new tools to accomplish jobs that were previously unimaginable. The real power of electromagnetism, engineers found, was less in its ability to move trains, see inside a patient's body, and turn night into day than it was to store, manipulate, and distribute information. But all these uses are some very fundamental principles. Behind all these uses are some very fundamental principles of physics that have led us to the brink of discovering the true nature of everything in the universe. It's these simple principles of a new age that you're going to look at in the first part of this book. I can already hear some of you saying, hey, when do we get to the stuff about computers? You're there. The subject of these first chapters are the stuff of the computers. And it doesn't matter what type of computer you're talking about. Mainframe, desktop, laptop, table, digital music player, camera, GPS, smartphone, smartwatch, or glass. All are computers and all are work using some version of the principles and technology you'll find here. Chapter one, the ghostly Legos of computing. The entire world right now is run by information. Our entire world is being controlled and operated by tiny invisible ones and zeros that are flashing through the air and flashing through the wires around us. Chris Doyen, computer activist, hiding out in Canada. Louis C.K. has a routine where his daughter asks a simple question that leads to a metaphysical issue people have pondered for ages. It begins with a question about why she can't go outside in the rain, and why it's raining, and why are there clouds, and it becomes a dissertation on why Louis doesn't know more, and why he didn't listen in school, etc. The string of answers finally lead father and daughter to an ultimate question. Because some things are and some things are not. Why? Because things that are not can't be. Why? Because nothing would be. Understanding how a computer works is a lot like that. You say a hard drive uses a magnet to write files, but then you're obligated to explain why. And then you have to say why magnets attract certain metals, and then explain why magnets have these invisible force fields. And don't expect your computer to explain itself. It maintains a, a sphinx-like silence. Shouldn't there be doodads and thingamajigs that are pumping or swinging, flashing or beeping, vibrating or rotating, or at least ticking and talking? For all you can tell about your computer works from opening it up and looking inside, your computer might as well be carved out of soap. In your computer, the things that make it really work are all ghosts. You've never seen them. You see only what they do, like a lamp thrown to the floor by a poltergeist. And computers, from PCs to a Galaxy X phone, tightly tuck away their secrets. You have to keep asking why. And if you ask long enough, you get into physical states filled with objects so small you can't see them, or that exist only in ghostly states, such as the vast parts of the electromagnetic spectrum or some screwy spinning quantum string, all of which are invisible to mere humans. The only way to get even a hint about what these little ghosts are like are to fling them around in the giant, mile-wide magnets 
like the Large Hadron Collider, until they smash into each other and create even smaller, rarer ghosts that vanish as soon as they appear. We're just left with only the contrails they leave behind, and from those we try to figure out what just happened. These little invisible ghosts are the ultimate things, the tiny invisible ones and zeros, as Doyen says. The ghostly little digital Legos that unite in different combinations to create everything in your computer, tablet, or smartphone. To understand, really understand, how a microprocessor, a monitor, or a printer works, you have to understand the ghostly workings of electricity, waves, magnetism, binary math, and data packets. So let's examine them all. Don't be frightened. They're friendly ghosts, I think. How waves take the universe on a joyride. Waves do far more than carry surf surfers on a wet thrill ride. Waves are essential to the working of computers. They move data from one place to another and provide the beat that every PC component marches to. Without waves, we'd never be able to see the solutions, or images, or words that result from the machine's computations. Without waves, we'd be beached, or may, we may not exist at all. According to some theories of physics, waves are the ultimate stuff of the universe. Space, Earth, you and I are no more than the interference patterns created by the crisscrossing of waves, which are created by tiny, tiny, tiny vibrating strings. Indeed, at times, it seems as if the thing we think of as solid Earth is just an illusion. Under the right circumstances, waves pass through our buildings, rocks, waters, and other waves, and even our own bodies. It's as if the Earth is no more than a wad of so soppy tissue. Here's how this humming master universe reaches down to play its tunes on the computer. If you've ever played with toys, you're familiar with the two most common mechanical waves in the universe, transverse waves and longitudinal waves. When you and a friend move the ends of a jump rope up and down, the graceful humps traveling the rope are a transverse wave. Here's a transverse wave, trough, crest, trough, crest, Here's the amplitude and the wavelength. This is different distance between two troughs. Examples of transverse waves include light, surface earthquake waves, surface water waves, magnetic waves, and the wave people in a football stadium create. Longitudinal waves are found in the depths of water and earth. A tsunami or earthquake moves tremendous energy through these media until they reach the earth's surface or the shallows of the sea where they convert to transverse waves. Freeway traffic jams, with their alternative congestion and fleeting moments of faster driving, are also longitudinal waves. Here's a longitudinal waves with compression, dilation, there's a wavelength, there's an amplitude, and an undisturbed medium that will soon be disturbed. Both types of waves can carry energy, information, and destruction. They can be measures of time and distance. Both types are created with some force, like vocal cords, a rock thrown in water, a meteor smashing into earth, is exerted against their mediums. Transverse waves can travel through solids and liquids, but they do not travel through gases because air does not have ele the elasticity needed to push the waves' vibrating molecules back into place. Only longitudinal waves may use gases as a medium. Despite that difference, longitudinal waves can morph into transverse waves and vice versa when they confront a different kind of medium. Both waves have similar components. In both types of waves, two fundamental measurements are the wavelength and the frequency. Wavelength is the distance between one crest or compressed area to the next. Frequency is the number of waves measured by wavelength that pass through a stationary point in one section. Second, the longer the wavelength, the lower the frequency. Frequency is measured by hertz. Generally, the higher the hertz, the more energy a wave contains. In audio, hertz means a higher pitch sound. So hertz is the number of cycles in a second. Transverse waves in the water and longitudinal waves in the air are both called mechanical because they depend on the mechanical mechanism of their media to propagate. That, however, is an illusion. The energy that goes into creating and maintaining waves is transferred by molecules knocking against each other, similar to how runners in a relay race hand off a, the baton. Next time you're at a lake or beach, observe how a bird or boat floating on the surface of the water only bobs up and down in place when a wave passes under it. Its horizontal position does not change. Another type of wave, electromagnetic, is not mechanical. Electromagnetic waves encompass light, infrared light, radio, x-rays, gamma rays, and neutrinos. They're all part of the electromagnetic spectrum in which waves range from a wavelength smaller than an atom to wavelengths bigger than the Earth. Take a look at this. Gamma rays are 10 to the negative 12th. This is the radiation length. X-rays are shorter. Ultraviolet is nearly visible. Then we have visible light. Then we've got infrared light, microwave light, and radio. Radio is very long wavelengths. The scale of the wavelength is, is interesting as well. There's the frequency. 
the higher the frequency, the lower the, the wavelength. I hope that makes sense. And this is the temperature of objects at which this radiation is the most intense wavelength emitted. Interesting. Electromagnetic waves do not require any type of media and are the only waves that can travel through the vacuum of space. Although non mechanical, electromagnetic waves are transverse, doubly transverse. They consist of electric and magnetic fields that, like other transverse waves, vibrate perpendicular to the direction in which the wave is moving. But the two fields vibrate at right angles to each other, and each expansion and collapse of a field creates an opposite field. The vibrations of electrical fields generate magnetic fields. Vibrations of magnetic fields generate electrical fields. The result is a never-ending bootstrap that pushes the way forward at the speed of light. 